Good afternoon, and thank you for joining. I'm Matt Roth with Baylor College of Medicine, and I welcome you to today's presentation. The Extracellular RNA Communication Consortium is an NIH Common Fund program which works to advance the science and research of extracellular RNA. The consortium hosts monthly presentations on a variety of research topics, and I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Sasmita Sahu, who is an associate assistant professor at the Cardiovascular Research Center at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. The title of her presentation is Exosomes and XRNA in Modulating Cellular Epitranscriptome and Regeneration. Sasmita? Thanks, Matt, for the invitation and your kind introduction. And I'd like to thank Kayla for organizing the talk. Hello, everyone. Um, I, I, I hope you are able to hear me well. Uh, thanks for joining us in this snowy and stormy day, especially for those who are in East Coast in America. It is a great pleasure to be here discussing about our two emerging and exciting branches of science. One is exosomes and another is epitranscriptome, as, as my title shows, and I will elaborate on both shortly. However, as you can see, um, I'm not able to move my slides. Give me a second. Yes, there we go. Uh, so as you can see from the research publication landscape of these two research areas, both um, were known to exist many, many decades ago and discovered in around the same time in the 1970s and early 80s. However, only recently these two fields have become research hotspots. As you can see, exosomes research peaked about 10 years ago after several important discoveries in methods and in exosomal contents. And epitranscriptomic research, although not following as closely as the exosome research, which is just starting to experience its exceptional impact and growth. And you would wonder, why am I discussing these two research areas together here? Uh, because not only I strongly believe in the parallelism that exists in the growth of these two research areas, at the same time, I believe that paths of these two distinct mechanisms crosstalk more often than not in the real biological, cellular, and molecular world, regulating cellular RNA, possibly their secretions, and helping cells communicate and also affecting several disease and therapeutic mechanisms. I'll bring in the exosome story first. When exosomes were discovered about 30 years ago, they were considered as cellular debris or garbage bags of the cells taking out a waste out of the cells. However, considering what we know now, I'm very skeptical to call anything in a cell as debris. As many of you uh, are familiar of these images, these are only electron micrographs showing vesicles taken out of the cell. Since their early discovery, publication on exosomes is growing ex exponentially, especially after discovery that exosomes carry RNA and microRNAs in early 2007, um, now published by Dr. Ian Wals group. Two articles were published in uh, 1994 in comparison to more than 1,600 that you see saw in 2017. Exodom's research in multiple fields have accelerated in the last five years. Uh, as um, the, the graph shows that cancer field is leading the way, uh, my research area, cardiovascular, is yet to go full throttle in this interesting area of research. Indeed, the potential of exosomes and other classes of microvesicles as a means of molecular cargo transport is uh, intensively studied now. So in light of the newer discoveries, the modern science perceives exosomes as cellular messengers, and exosomal communication is now visualized as nature's way of emailing or twittering cell-specific signature messages to recipient cells, exactly precise and selective contents that are delivered to the recipient cells, like uh, Twitter, which has specific uh, word limits. Um, uh, so uh, I hope to convince you of these in the next half an hour or so. Exosomes have been shown to both promote disease and disseminating these factors um, uh, and also can attenuate disease, and I'll be talking about a little bit uh, on both of these mechanisms. To start with the role of exosomes in therapeutics, especially in cardiovascular therapeutics, there are several clinical trials as summarized by this slide 
uh, adopted from a publication shows that um, uh, stem cells isolated from different sources, such as CK cells, mesenchymal stem cells, cardiosphere cells from heart, uh, CD34 cells, bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells, and bone marrow cells as, uh, themselves, um, those have been tried in clinical trials. And uh, one would imagine that the additional fortified material provided to the heart by these cells should make uh, impact to repair, positive impact to repair and revive, uh, and that has the potential to compensate for irreversible loss of myocytes. Um, unfortunately, the expected uh, improvement that was after stem cell transplantation was not obtained, and only in clinical trial results we see moderate improvement in cardiac function and exercise tolerance in patients. That leads to the question uh, why the stem cells, which are shown to be uh, working excellent in in vitro and in vivo experiment, are not that functional when they are transplanted to the human myocardium. Um, and so one of the challenges is the transplanted stem cells are eliminated quickly from the heart as um, because of the pumping nature of the myocardium, very few cells are retained and viability of the transplanted cells are low in the ischemic milieu of the heart. Uh, that leads to the hypothesis that paracrine secretion, especially exosomes, uh, are thought to mediate the stem cell function. When we see the composition of stem cell uh, paracrine secretion, we find two important uh, uh, components. One is the vesicular components, which can be microvesicles, exosomes, and several other vesicles that are known to exist. Uh, or it can be soluble component, including proteins, RNAs, and microRNAs. So when I was starting my research with human CD34 stem cells, which were being used in clinical trials, we decided to see whether these cells secret exosomes and this electron micrograph that I'm showing here shows uh, a huge multivesicular body in the thin leaf of cytoplasm of the stem cell, CD34 positive stem cell. And you can see invagination from inward invagination of the multivesicular body membrane and granular content. Uh, possibly suggesting nucleic acid material that are being pulled into the invagination at the membrane. Uh, and fusion of these multivesicular bodies to the plasma membrane will release these uh, uh, exosomes out of the cell. And uh, now the protocols and um, very robust protocols um, that exist that can isolate exosomes from the conditioned media of the uh, cells or tissue secretions. And uh, those isolations show the same size and morphology as the intracellular exosome. So coming to our research, we isolated um, the exosomes, as I mentioned, from human CD34 positive cells. And these cells were isolated from peripheral blood of individuals post DCSF mobilization. And these cells were isolated mostly from healthy individuals for the studies that I'm going to talk about today. We cultured these cells for a short period of time, uh, not wanting to differentiate these cells by longer culture, and uh, collected the conditioned media and analyzed the conditioned media by dynamic light scattering analysis, which shows two distinct peaks, at one at eight nanometer, possibly indicating the uh, soluble component, and another at 60 nanometer, possibly the vesicular component. And our ultracentrifugation and flotation on a sucrose gradient separated successfully these exosomes and remaining material from the uh, conditioned media, which we call is exosome depleted conditioned media. And DLS size measurement shows the exosomes at 60 nanometer and depleted conditioned media at nine nanometers, suggesting that um, uh, we separated them uh, successfully. So, First, we tried the function, uh, tested the function of this exosome and exosome depleted condition media in a simple matrix LT formation assay. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this assay, where uh, um, um, plating endothelial cells uh, uh, on a matrix L substance form tube like structures indicative of their angiogenic properties. When we used basal media, we didn't see any true formation. Uh, that's our control. And when we added the conditioned media from CD34 cells, we see tube-like structure indicating the conditioned media from 
CD34 cells were angiogenic. And we separated this conditioned media into exosomes and exosome depleted conditioned media. And we see only exosome fraction is forming tubes here, whereas the depleted exosome depleted conditioned media did not form any tubes, suggesting that the exosome fraction retained the angiogenic activity of these um, conditioned media of the cells. We uh, verified this observation in an in vivo corneal angiogenesis assay where implantation of a uh, proangiogenic pellet in the avascular cornea induces uh, uh, vessel-like growth from the basal limbus. And you can see the PBS control did not have any proangiogenic-like growth. And interestingly, mononuclear cell-derived exosomes, these are the total uh, mononuclear cells uh, from the peripheral blood, which are depleted of the CD34 uh, cellular fraction. And we cultured these cells in the similar media as CD34 um, cells to control for the effect of conditioned media on the exosome isolation. And interestingly, these mononuclear cell-derived exosomes were not angiogenic, whereas only CD34 positive uh, cell-derived exosomes were proangiogenic in this corneal assay indicating that um, the exosomes from different cell types behave differently, have different functional properties, and these uh, exosomes from CD34 cells have both in vitro and in vivo angiogenic activity. Next, we tested the beneficial angiogenic effect of CD34 cell-derived exosomes in two different mouse models, one in Heinlein ischemia model and another in myocardial infarction model. To de describe briefly these two models, in the Heinlein model, we block ligate the femoral artery that provides, the, provides blood to the limb. And in a myocardial ischemia model, we ligate the coronary artery that supplies blood to the entire myocardium. And immediately post ligation, we inject the uh, exosomes, isolated exosomes, or cells, or the conditioned media, or con uh, conditioned media depleted of exosomes, which were all isolated from equal number of cells into the putative ischemic tissue Im immediately after the, after the ligation. So it is uh, ischemia is going to develop uh, in a few days, as we see in uh, the limb model. And in the heart model, the, the ischemia starts immediately. But physiological remodeling, um, there is an acute phase of remodeling, and there is a chronic phase of remodeling, which continues until many weeks after the ligation. So uh, now discussing the results from these models. Um, First, I would like to bring your attention to the PBS injected mice limbs, where the limbs fell off. It's a severe ischemic model. The mononuclear exosomes, as well as the CD34 exosome depleted condition media, in all these conditions, most of the limbs uh, of the mice that injected with these materials, the limbs fell off. However, a limbs injected with CD34 exosomes or cells or conditioned media from equal number of cells that retain their limbs, as well as the blood flow as indicated by the red and green um, uh, laser Doppler imaging here, uh, shows the blood flow to the limbs were much uh, significantly higher as compared to the control or exosome depleted condition media injected limbs. So uh, we conclude that these exosomes mimic the therapeutic activity in this hind limb ischemia model. Similarly, in a myocardial model, we saw similar observation where CD34 exosomes were beneficial, and this beneficial effect was lost in the exosome depleted condition media. And these are the histological analysis uh, in showing in front area shows that exosome injection uh, revived the tissue. Uh, and we do, do, do not know whether it is mostly repairing the tissue from the detrimental effects of ischemia or it is regeneration. And we saw uh, proangiogenic effects that were significantly higher in the exosome injected uh, myocardium. So we conclude that the cell free CD34 exosomes are therapeutic. To study the composition of the exosomes that would mimic this therapeutic, uh, that would uh, be responsible for this therapeutic angiogenesis, we first analyze the proteins in the CD34 exosomes by running in proangiogenic array because we found angiogenic activity of these exosomes. 
Unfortunately, as you can see uh, from this graph here, we did not find any uh, major proangiogenic protein that is present in CD34 exosomes that would explain the proangiogenic function. Mm -hmm. Next, we ran a 2D dyes analysis uh, comparing the CD34 exosomes to mononuclear cell derived exosomes. And even with that experiment, uh, none of the proteins identified by mass spectrometry here, the CD34 exosomal proteins are marked uh, with green fluorescent, and we run mass spectrometry analysis to identify those proteins. Uh, but unfortunately, we could, could not correlate the effects that we found, the pro-angiogenic um, uh, and uh, antifibrotic effects that we found after CD34 exosome injection, and uh, that did not correlate with the proteins that were enriched in these exosomes. Uh, so uh, we moved on to see if there are other components, and we all know that RNA is a major component in exosomes, is the bioanalyzer analysis comparing cellular and exosomal RNA from CD34 uh, cells and exosomes shown here. The cellular RNA is enriched with 18S and 28S. However, the exosomal RNAs are mostly enriched for uh, microRNAs or small RNAs, indicating selecting packaging of exosomal RNA. And this is a quantification of, um, uh, of the microRNA and their nucleotide content. And we ran um, Acidetrix arrays comparing mononuclear cells and CD34 cells and mononuclear exosomes and CD34 exosomes. And to uh, our uh, su not surprise, we were expecting that they would be, they would have proangiogenic RNA um, now from their functional activities. We found several um, microRNAs that were enriched in CD34 exosomes that were uh, known to have proangiogenic activity. And microRNA-126, which was one of the most enriched microRNA in CD34 uh, exosomes, we decided to study that by uh, knocking down um, microRNA-126 from the CD34 exosomes. Um, so here is the functional data from um, myocardial ischemia surgery. Uh, Post-MI surgery, we injected either scramble control exosomes, exosome containing scramble control microRNAs, or exosome containing entire microRNA-126, um, showing the function of the heart significantly decreased when we took out away the microRNA-126 from CD34 exosomes, as well as infarct area was significantly higher in microRNA-126 knockdown uh, exosomes. So microRNA-126, we determined um, that it is, uh, it, microRNA-126 in these exosomes is essential for their function. So I'm not going into the details of microRNA-126 mediated mechanisms. We analyzed um, uh, proangiogenic mechanisms for microRNA-126 and its cell cycle regulation and proliferation. However, I would like to share some of the interesting data regarding the uptake in vivo uptake of CD34 exosomes. In vitro, we found that these exosomes were uptaken into endothelial cell, uh, primary myocytes, et cetera. However, in vivo studies of exosome uptake are challenging. And uh, to study the uh, uptake of exosomes, we tag them with uh, uh, rhodamine PE, which is a longer staying uh, exosomal uh, lipid um, tag, uh, which makes the exosomes fluorescent. We induced myocardial infarction surgery in the heart and injected to the exosomes to the heart and isolated the, uh, harvested the heart tissue at different time points, prepared single cell suspension from the uh, heart tissue where the exosomes were injected and analyzed for the presence of PE fluorescence that would implicate the presence of exosomes in those cell types. So here is the data from control cells which are were injected with non-fluorescent exosomes. Uh, and these are injected at one hour and four hours with fluorescent exosomes. You can see 
almost uh, an 80 to 90 percent of cells were positive between one hour to four hours in the myocardium uh, area where we injected the exosomes. However, they were all gone. At least the fluorescence was gone when um, we tested it at 24 hours, implicating the exosomes uh, derived from CD34 stem cells were quickly uptaken by the cells in the ischemic tissue. To identify what kind of cells are uptaking these exosomes, we prepared cocktail of antibodies uh, uh, CD31-PC for endothelial cells, for cardiomyocytes, and we found that both endothelial cells and cardiomyocytes uh, are uptaking the exosomes a bit at a higher rate by the endothelial cells. However, to our surprise, the fibroblasts were not uh, much uptaking the exosomes. So I would like to add that when we did uh, add the CD34 exosomes into fibroblast in vitro, they were uptaking these exosomes. However, we don't know if there is a differential uptake of these exosomes in vitro or there is um, some other mechanism because they're so quickly uptaken by the exosomes, by the endothelial cells and cardiomyocytes that they are not available to be uptaken by fibroblast, uh, we don't know the answer to that. Um, so we just conclude that they are most efficiently uptaken by the endothelial cells and to a certain extent by the cardiomyocytes in the skin myocardium and deliver their content. So when uh, we uh, study exosome uptake, uh, some groups have studied cellular uptake of exosomes, and these electron micrograph demonstrate cellular uptake um, uh, of CD34 um, exosomes consistent with some of the published or presented literature in several meetings, intact exosomes from certain cell types have been shown to pierce through the cell membrane and possibly release their content into the cytoplasmic vesicles, uh, such as possibly early endosomes and late endosomes. Um, maybe the pH in this vesicle impact their release, um, on content release. Uh, we found the same thing. These nanovolt tagged exosomes, uh, intact in exosomes, where um, these seem to be intact here, and they seem to migrate through the cytoplasm, and we found almost intact exosomes in, uh, in the cytoplasmic area. So we believe um, the observation that the other groups have, that these exosomes are are uptaken intact into the cytoplasm probably is true, but more investigation, thorough investigation is needed to confirm this observation. So coming back to the same still derived exosomes and how it impacted cardiovascular regenerative biology, not only our data, our data from other groups uh, found that exosomes from mesenchymal stem cells, from cardiosphere derived cells, and uh, from even mouse embryonic stem cells, they are beneficial. They have beneficial effects for cardiac repair. I'm not going to the details of the mechanism, uh, but here I have listed the diverse uh, cardiovascular sources of EVs, their bioactivity and therapeutic implication. You can see many different cell types published um, by different groups, and they have been shown to have beneficial effect uh, in sepsis, wound healing, atherosclerosis, pulmonary hypertension, heart failure, ischemia, reforces, and injury, et cetera. So I'd like to bring your attention to one interesting paper where uh, it has been shown uh, by Dr. Eduardo Marban's group that exosomes from cardiosphere-derived cells, these are exosomes from cardiosphere-derived cells with improved ejection fraction and fractional shortening. However, exosomes from dormant fibroblast in light blue here, they could not improve the myocardial function. However, interestingly, when these exosomes were treated to the dormant fibroblast, uh, shown by the purple bar here, these exosomes were therapeutic, and essentially these exosomes from cardiosphere cells converting our fibroblast into beneficial fibroblast, and the authors claim that the stem cell exosomes disseminate the beneficial effect to other cardiac cells, and um, 
this is an interesting observation that exosomes not only transfer when it's therapeutic molecules such as microRNAs and other compositions to target cells, but also can amplify their beneficial effects by modulating multiple cell types indirectly. So when we compare uh, now, uh, why do we consider exosomes as a therapeutic, novel therapeutic agent? Are they any better than the cells? Uh, and uh, the observation suggests they, they are uh, probably a better therapeutic agent as compared to cells uh, because cells are living entities which are fragile, which have to be viable to be functional. However, exosomes are non-living and robust. They have a robust membrane which protects their composition. As the cells, they are bioactive and almost mimic identical beneficial effects as compared to the cells. Cells are immune intolerant and exosomes from certain cells, um, not uh, from dendritic cells or immune cells, but certain other cells have been shown to be immune tolerant. Um, and these are cell-free uh, um, entities where uh, as cells have DNA and therefore exosomes are preferred material for therapeutic applications. Um, so for myocardial application, the cells need to be retained by the myocardium to function. However, exosomes, because of their super efficient uptake by cardiac cells, um, they can be effective immediately and they don't uh, need to be retained that long as the cells. And other interesting um, uh, properties for exosomes is they can cross blood-brain barrier unlike the cells. So they have numerous practical and conceptual advantage over the cells. And um, um, however, there are certain challenges. I just discussed the benefits, um, but the challenges are to manufacture clinical grade exosomes, efficient loading of selective contents, and cell and tissue targeting. So other groups are uh, like our collaborator, Michael Davies from Georgia Tech, uh, we are working uh, to develop predictive model to identify functionally important microRNAs. And why this is interesting? Because if we know the positive uh, molecules inside the exosomes, microRNAs, small RNAs, link RNAs, or proteins, or even lipids, we can manufacture them ideally um, uh, and produce artificial exosomes, uh, which can be devised as an off the cell therapeutic product. Uh, so now uh, we saw the uh, therapeutic and beneficial effects. Do they play a role in disease diagnosis and dissemination of risk factors from disease cells? The answer is yes. A uh, few years ago, we published that exosomes are produced from cardiomyocyte. It's shown by presence of multivesicular bodies inside a cardiomyocyte here in a healthy human heart as well as patient heart uh, and in mouse heart as well that these myocytes that produce exosomes, however, we do not know uh, whether they secrete different exosomes under healthy and ischemic or heart failure conditions. And physiological function of the cardiac secreted exosomes, there is no direct evidence uh, so far. Although there are papers which try to address this, uh, these uh, questions. Uh, one of such publication is, uh, is uh, published by Costanza Emanuel's group, where coronary artery bypass graft surgery increases the exosomes in um, plasma, so effective concentration of exosomes were increased, as well as uh, concentration of cardiac microRNAs in plasma is increased. That suggests that probably cardiomyocytes release these uh, exosome, microRNA carrying exosomes to plasma uh, and um, we need to study what these microRNAs in plasma do. Uh, do they affect other tissues such as kidney and lungs and liver and many other? Do they cross talk with other organs in the body or what do they do? We need to address those questions. So one of these, um, the detrimental effects uh, from fibroblast exosomes has been shown by Dr. Hajar's room group from Mount Sinai where they have shown a particular detrimental microRNA-126 is increased in heart failure and specifically the concentration of microRNA-146 is increased in the exosomes derived from mouse failing hearts. And um, 
uh, the fibroblasts, they trace the origin of this microRNA-146 to fibroblasts by measuring the prime microRNAs and other uh, things and compare them to different cell types in the heart. And interestingly, they have shown that these fibroblast-derived exosomes, which now have high microRNA-146 in heart failure condition, they affect uh, adversely uh, the function of cardiomyocyte, uh, primary cardiomyocyte, contractile function of primary cardiomyocyte. So these are uh, negative effects of um, fibroblast-derived exosomes in fa heart failure condition. To summarize this part, exosomes in cardiovascular microcommunication, um, they can uh, both uh, mediate local and distant communication and alter gene expression and this organ uh, structure and function uh, in, uh, in the vicinity or at a distance. Uh, there are certain challenges in EV research, so the isolation uh, techniques, there is no, no, not a single method that is thought to be uh, efficient as well as um, uh, purify exosomes with, uh, um, uh, with absolute separation from other vesicles. Ultracentrifugation is still the gold standard. Um, peg mediated precipitations, uh, they just eliminate water and isolate most of the secretome. So we need to be aware of that. There is heterogeneity in exosomes and other vesicle size, composition, and origin. And we do not know the, the release mechanisms, the uptake mechanisms, especially in vivo and uh, what is their half-life kinetics of uptake and return, retention, and uh, to develop GMT-grade exosomes for their therapeutic uh, uh, purposes, batch-to-batch -batch variation, purity and quality control is still a major challenge, and techniques for characterization and quantification of exosomes are uh, using closed cytometry, and TA and DLAs are still developing. So uh, also cell and tissue specific exosomes in vivo, um, uh, can we identify heart derived exosomes in plasma or lung derived exosomes specifically originate, uh, originating from lungs in plasma? So we do not know their surface markers. So there is a lot to do in this research and research is progressing very fast and I will not be surprised in next five to 10 years if many of these questions are reasonably answered. Uh, now, uh, I'll switch to the other part of my talk on epitranscriptomic regulation in disease and therapeutic, and uh, at the end, I'll bring a relation of uh, epitranscriptome with exosome. So, um, uh, Prabhu in my lab is, is a major contributor uh, to the, this part of the research. Um, so, to introduce this epitranscriptomic regulation, I'll go back to the central dogma of biology where we know that genetic information is passed from DNA to RNA to protein. In addition, now we know that epigenetic modifications, including chemical modification and methylation of DNA, and reversible histone methylation and acetylation regulates the transcriptional process. It was also discovered that RNA molecules are not simple linear molecules as we think. They are known to contain several different uh, types of modification which are dynamic and reversible. Very recently, it was discovered that these modifications affect the fate and function of RNA. So these modifications add another regulatory layer of gene expression between DNA and protein. And one of the most prevalent and functionally relevant modification in mRNA is M6A. That's uh, the sixth position of adenosine is modified methylated. Almost 7,000 mRNAs and 500 linked RNAs and primary microRNAs are known to contain M6A. Why is this uh, important? Because we know uh, the map of M6A shows that M6A or these RNA modifications are abundant in the start and stop core and implicating their functional, they regulate the RNA fate and function. Moreover, the microRNA binding site is also known to be heavily methylated. So this implicates that um, they have significant effect on the mRNA uh, biological function in cells and tissues. So uh, seeing at the publication, we know that nuclear export and translation, RNA degradation, RNA splicing, primary microRNA processing, uh, modulation of microRNA-mRNA binding, 
stem cell pluripotency and obesity and metabolism has been shown to be regulated by this process. So we studied uh, what is the relevance of M6A in disease mechanisms um, because it was relatively unexplored in uh, relation to cardiac uh, remodeling. So what we did to start with, we took human non-failing healthy tissues and failing tissues and we quantified the M6A, total M6A present in the RNA. And we find a significant increase of M6A in the heart failure conditions. Uh, similarly, in pigs, we created myocardial ischemia shown here in red. They have significantly higher levels of M6A as compared to the sham hearts. Uh, same observation was made in mice after mouse myocardial surgeries where we found that M6A is significantly increased one week after MI surgery. So we think it's increase in RNA methylation or M6A is an universal process across species in response to heart failure. So this is a very dynamic process and I'm going to briefly discuss the molecules involved in regulation of M6A. There are writers, as the name suggests, they add this methyl group to adenosine. There are erasers, uh, writers such as metal group of proteins, and uh, those add the methyl, uh, methyl group. Erasers which demethylate uh, the adenosine, they are LKBH5 of proteins, LKBH5 and FTO, and they are called erasers. There are also reader proteins which read the location of M6A and direct the mRNA to either to ribosomes for degradation or to transport the mRNA across the nucleus. So interestingly, we analyzed for several writers and reader pro uh, writers and erasure protein in the heart. And interestingly, we found that FTO, uh, which is an erasure, M6A erasure, is decreased in, in the failing hearts, uh, both by RNA and uh, Western blood analysis. Similarly, FTO was decreased in mouse hearts post MI, post myocardial infarction surgery. Uh, and this is confirmed by immunostaining, and this decrease in FTO in failing hearts uh, you know, goes with our hypothesis that it could be responsible for the increase in M6A that we see in the failing hearts. So to address if FTO regulates M6A, we took um, we did some in vitro experiments using adult primary myocytes, cardiomyocyte isolated from rat heart, and we found that in FTO knockdown myocytes, M6A is significantly increased. As well as when we treat these myocytes uh, to hypoxia, the M6A is also significantly increased uh, associated with decreased FTO. When we overexpress FTO in these hypoxic myocytes, we find the M6A levels are almost returning to normal, indicating that FTO could regulate M6A in myocytes. And what does this, this FTO do? When we analyze the myocyte contractile function using anoptic measurements, these are untreated normal myocytes, which have regular rhythming um, beating contraction. However, in SIFTO-treated myocytes, we found arrhythmias in more than 60% of myocytes. So we think FTO regulates cardiomyocyte contractile function is measured by these parameters. I'm not going to the details, but when we overexpress FTO by this, uh, shown by these green bars, several contractile function and calcium dynamics of these myocytes improved. So FTO is required for calcium recycling in contractile function uh, in adult primary cardiomyocytes. And gain of function in mouse heart uh, to, to study that, we overexpress FTO in mice hearts using AV vectors. And after overexpressing FTO, um, we conducted myocardial ischemia surgeries and measured the cardiac function after four weeks of surgery. So, two, uh, interestingly, in the hearts with myocardial infarction surgery, the function implicated by ejection fraction and fractional shortening go down. And in this FTO overexpressed heart, the function of the heart recover, implicating that FTO regulates cardiac function. 
So to identify what are the uh, targets of FG or demethylation in failing hearts compared to healthy controls, we went to MERIF sequencing. Uh, it's a, a immunoprecipitation of RNA similar to chip sequencing, but using RNA. So we fragment RNA IP with anti M6A, and then we analyze the, the uh, RNA using NGS and validate using qPCR analysis. So in the sham hearts, um, uh, we found regular M6A levels, but in MI hearts, we find higher M6A. It's shown by the total reads in MI hearts here. When we overexpress FTO, the total M6A reads went back to normal, almost equivalent to the SAM hearts, uh, implicating that FTO regulates M6A in these hearts. And the specific target, as you can see, uh, presented by this blue set of genes here, which are hypomethylated. Hypomethylation is indicated by blue. And overexpression of FTO hypomethylated these particular genes. And we identified several pathways involved with contraction, cardiac contraction, fibril organization, heart rate, regulating blood vessel development. Those are the major uh, uh, transcript involved in these pathways, those were targeted by FTO selectively. And this was confirmed from uh, the analysis, MERIP analysis. To, uh, to elaborate a little bit, uh, mRNA is a linear molecule, and most of the, for example, SORCA mRNA is used. Not all the sites in SORCA is methylated. SORCA is methylated in particular regions. So we found SORCA and Ryanodin receptor, uh, as shown as an example here, those are hyper, hypermethylated at particular sites after MI. And when we overexpress FTO, you see the methylation goes down as indicated by the green um, reads here in both SORCA and Ryanodin receptor. So we validate this data by pulling down M6A positive RNA, and we found that SORCA and Ryanodin receptor is hypermethylated in human RNA as well. And to compare their expression with adeno-FT overexpression, we found that SORCA expression, which goes down in heart failure, and therefore probably responsible for reduction in contraction of uh, failing hearts, it improved when we overexpress FTO, indicating that FTO probably regulates SORCA uh, by a, via methylation of particular sites on its mRNA. So I'm not going to the details of more mechanism that we studied, but just to show you a few more examples, these are all contractile proteins that are hypomethylated by FT overexpression, which erases this methylation that is found in heart failure condition. And to study their protein synthesis, de novo protein synthesis, we um, uh, studied that using SILAC method, stable isotope labeling, and we quantified that the protein expression for this hypomethylated contractile transcript improved when we overexpress FTO. And this is just showing our uh, MERIP and SILAC data. Uh, they, are, they implicate similar mRNAs, which are hypomethylated, have improved expression of proteins. So to summarize the methylation data, uh, cardiac function is regulated by FTO in diminished uh, failing hearts. Uh, FTO goes down, M6A is increased, in, uh, decreasing the circa function. When we overexpress FTO, it, uh, it, it has the opposite effect. So uh, to combine our exosome studies with the methylation, we now show that a CD34 exosomes that skew the M6A and FTO expression post MI in the interest of time. I would not go into the details, but I will just show that in CD34 exosome injected hearts, we have more FTO as compared to the MI hearts, and that improves the function. So from literature, we also know that uh, several other microRNAs, they regulate M6A dependent mechanism. Uh, in hepatocellular carcinoma cells, microRNA146 is correlated with YTDF2 molecule, which is a reader protein of M6A. And this paper actually shows the function and relation of how microRNA145 directly targets this M6A reader in this carcinoma cell line. 
Further, the other way, M6A on mRNA is also regulated by microRNAs as shown by this interesting paper. It shows um, that um, these microRNAs, they, uh, they help bind uh, metal-3 binding to the mRNA and methylate the mRNA and thereby impact and promote reprogramming to pluripotency. And interestingly, uh, I, I did not mention the other paper that I'm going to talk about. Uh, there is a paper showing or knockout in adipose tissues reduces circulating microRNAs. And here in this paper, they show that or knockdown reduces the metal-3 expression. So therefore, it is possible that global secretion of microRNAs is regulated by M6A and vice versa. In support, uh, there is an interesting study that shows that metal-3 knockdown regulates the microRNA levels, um, relative expression, their prime microRNA levels, prime microRNA processing, and um, uh, this suggests, uh, implicates that M6 regulates microRNA biogenesis. In the same line, uh, we can ask, does M6 regulate exosomal packaging of microRNA? And with that, I would like to comment that next generation of experiments is going to address that and will discover probably the crosstalk in disease dissemination and therapeutic mechanisms involving um, exosomes and M6A. With that, I would like to thank uh, my uh, um, uh, postdocs and people who have significantly contributed this re to research. These are um, uh, uh, our group. And my mentors, Dr. Valentin Kuster and Dr. Roger Hazar at Mount Sinai. And I would also like to thank our collaborators and funding sources. And uh, there is an information I'd like to pass to you. There is an annual meeting, ICEF 28 annual meeting, which would be conducted in Barcelona, Spain, that is on extracellular vesicles. Um, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Mita. That's a very nice talk, a lot of data. So yeah, we'll open the lines now, um, so feel free to ask, ask questions. If you could just identify yourself and your institution, that would be appreciated. Mahmoud Khan, Ohio State University. Hi, Hi. Shishmita. Hi. Uh, excellent talk. Uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, I'd, I'd like to commend you on the work. I have a few questions I just want to ask you on the first part of your talk. The first one is, what is the concentration of exosomes you are using to deliver it to the heart or during high limb ischemia? And then the second part is, can you, the functionality you are seeing is the single delivery, right? What if you deliver it multiple times? Do you think that the effect would be uh, synergistic? And what is the route of administration? I know it's mostly intramuscular, I guess. Yes, those are very interesting and practical questions. To answer your first question, concentration. So in our studies, because these studies were many years uh, conducted many years ago, and we know that nano NTA machine is the only available machine which measures exosome concentration, and that time we did not have that machine in the lab. So we ba we based our studies on the cellular concentration. So we took let's say. Uh, 100,000 cells, we took exosomes isolated from 100,000 cells. And we, to compare, we injected the cells as well as the exosomes and conditioned media from 100,000 cells. So that's how we dosed it. And I based those dose based on the clinical trial dose for the cell trial, cell therapy trial using CD34 exosomes, which was 5 million cells per kg body weight. So that's what I use, but I saw, I found several other papers, for example, Dr. Kishore. Um, sorry. So, so they have used a concentration measured by NTA, and uh, we know that these concentrations uh, are a little bit difficult to measure based on size because NTA does not effectively measure um, um, well uh, vesicles be below. 50, 40, 50 nanometers. So we have to be careful when we talk about concentration, but that's an excellent question. I think the field needs to address it uh, more effectively and efficiently than uh, what we have now. And the route of de delivery for myocardium, I think it, it has to be 
coronary because we can't do intracoronary. We can't do tailwind IV injections. There are two routes for human uh, trials, intracoronary, intramuscular. Uh, the intramuscular injection for exosomes are efficient, like local injections, because the exosomes can be up check in anywhere you inject. So if you inject by Telvin, they likely, you know, uh, end up in spleen and liver more than they will end up in the in the heart. So Dr. Marvin, uh, in a recent publication, um, he did a, an excellent comparison in a pig study, and I think the conclusion was that the local delivery is the best. So uh, the interesting point here is, you know, definitely the single injection, we are seeing uh, phenomenal benefits of exosomes. But what, what, are, what are your thoughts on multiple delivery? Like, I mean, it should be like a drug where you're delivering it over a period of time that could have some phenomenal benefits uh, if you compare that to cell therapy. Cell therapy, you know, at least the cell could regenerate. So the, the question I was asking is, what can, can you think about multiple delivery of these, you know, like a, like a drug, like a dosing? Because I see that from your ex vivo heart data, the exosomes, the fluorescence intensity drops within 24 hours. That means yeah. it is taken up by the cells really quick. So, yeah. I mean, the effect what you're seeing is only with a single delivery there, but prolonged for a period of time. What do you think about multiple delivery kind of approach? or a longevity of the delivery uh, using some sort of other, you know, um, uh, sustained release kind of system? I think that's an excellent question, and I, I'm sure a clinician can answer that better than me. But um, <laughs> for, as an exosome researcher, I think, you know, when we talk about multiple deliveries, if it is not IV, it's very difficult in humans. It's a big process, especially to deliver to the myocardium. Wow. So I, I don't know practically how many deliveries is possible. You know, the limitation of cell therapy is delivering the cells multiple times. So that is also going to be challenging for this exosome therapy. But the notion that the exosomes are uptaken quickly, and so the, the idea here is they might be more effective as compared to the cells. However, we need to do apples to apple comparison between exosomes and cells to reach a definite conclusion there. Thanks. Thank you, Sushmita. So the effect of exosomes is mostly, you know, might be a paracrine effect again by either, you know, uh, decreasing the fibroblast proliferation or inducing, uh, you know, the, the cardiomyocytes which are hibernating in the ischemic myocardium, ischemic, ischemic penumbra, might be it, it stimulates them and that's how it improves the functionality, basically. Yes, yes, and uh, you know they may affect the immune cells, infl infiltrating immune cells. They may affect other stem cells, and they, uh, the exosomes can have multiple indirect effect in addition to the direct delivery of the content. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last call. Questions for Sus Mina? Okay, great. Well, I'm sure she'd be happy to take any follow-up questions. So you can contact her by email. Also, I'd just like to uh, mention that these uh, presentations occur on the first Thursday of the month. Uh, the next presentation is uh, Thursday, February 1st. Uh, Ken Whitware from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine will be presenting. Uh, and so I'd encourage you to visit uh, our the consortium portal at exrna.org. You'll have, see all kinds of information there on the, uh, the consortium and also these presentations. Uh, there's also past presentations there, uh, video recordings of those webinars. So. Uh, thank you all for joining, and we'll see you in February.